directors, authorities, panelists, participants. Welcome to CAF's COP side event on catalyzing climate action in cities. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be the moderator of this event today. And um, first of all, uh, we would like to have some words on sustainable development of our Secretary General. Uh, then we're going to have uh, two moments of um, uh, for the side event. First, we're going to have uh, a presentation from uh, Christina Gamboa of the uh, World Building uh, Council and uh, from John Fernandez from the MIT. And then the idea is to uh, have an exchange with the governments, local governments from Brazil, Recife, and from the national government of Argentina um, uh, with uh, Rodrigo Rodriguez. And also inviting, thank you very much for, for participating, uh, Cavita from the uh, Green Climate Fund from the uh, Adaptation and Mitigation Division. Uh, so thank you very much everybody for participating here. And um, well, um, I'm gonna invite uh, Angel Cardenas, the Secretary General of uh, CAF, uh, to give some remarks in sustainability and climate change and cities. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, can you hear me guys well? Great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here uh, representing CAF. And I think my, um, my remarks will be uh, around to answer the question, how development institution can catalyze actions in sustainable and urban development sustainability. And uh, for that, I think, uh, so for CAF, the way we're seeing um, cities our diagnosis is A, in Latin America, we've seen uh, quite a fast paced and very disorganized trend in urban growth in the last couple of decades. And this could be illustrated that we went from 80% to 85%, or we hope to, uh, we're getting to 85% by 2050. And I think the main challenge there is that this growth has faced tremendous challenges from the social, economic, and environmental perspective. And when we talk about that, we have to also see that we have like a three big groups of cities in the region. We have the mega cities beyond 5 million, just too easy to illustrate. Let's think about Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Lima, Bogota. But then we have what we call the mid-size or the intermediate cities and then the smaller or small cities. Those three different cities, I mean, those three groups of cities are completely different realities and they have their own problems, and we also have to provide different solutions. In the case of the mega cities, I mean, we're seeing that while they are prepared and they have more technical capabilities, they still face major social and economic and environmental challenges. But I think the most concerning part are the intermediate or the mid-sized cities that due to the demographic changes in the last couple of decades, I mean, they're growing tremendously, and unlike the mega cities, they are not as well as prepared as they should be. So what to do about that? I mean, how to help them? That's one question we ask in CAF. Then we go to probably a more problematic city, cities, which is the smaller cities. I mean, these are like been under the radar for many years. I mean, these cities, normally they're not necessarily that have the capabilities from the economic, social, human capital perspective to address or to cope uh, the challenge of to develop a sustainable urban development strategy. So within that context, uh, CAF, in alliance with the French Agency Development, the Latin America uh, Facility Initiative, we have developed, and I have to read this because trust me, my jet lag is killing me, and I just got here and I, I was really worried I was gonna forget. Thank you. So I just want to get the name right because otherwise, LAIF Initiative on Cities and Climate Change, which is a financial instrument aimed to help these different cities and more importantly to develop a strategy to be able to partner up with this type of cities. In that context, we have then have a different strategy for different cities. We have the major cities or the mature cities, which are mostly capital cities. 
I mean, again, these are cities that have technical capabilities, have, are not necessarily that dependent from the federal or national government. They have access to financing. They have put on their agenda climate change initiatives, adaptation and mitigation initiatives, which this is very important because, I mean, they understand not only the climate change effects they have, but they can take action. And they do it through prioritizing policies and initiatives. Then you have uh, the mid-size. The story is a little different there. And why? Because as I said at the beginning of my remarks, they don't necessarily have all the capabilities from the technical perspective. So, and they're mostly dependent, that's what we have seen, um, of national governments or federal governments in terms of fiscal resources or even organizational and technical capabilities. So, in this case, our approach is to try to help them from a very upstream perspective how to, from the beginning, help them to conceptualize solutions that makes them understand, also help them to understand the priorities of climate change, and more importantly, they can develop solutions. A good example of that, if you let me tell you, it's a case we did in Colombia, Monteria, and that's in uh, the Antioquia department, if I'm correct, no? Cordoba. Cordoba, yeah. Should have known my wife is Colombia, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, and I live with one. So <laughs> anyway, besides that, a comment. Um, so in this case, we help the city to conceptualize a very integral solution from a very big part that will become by 2035, the city center of the Monteria, and that would provide a very sustainable solution. How do we do that? We could only do it if we partnered up from the beginning, understanding that they need a help in the, even the first stage of the project preparation and the feasibility of the studies. That's how we approach that. And that is completely different on the initial case that I mentioned about major cities. When you have major cities that have all the capability and resources, perhaps we have to help them in the last mile in terms of like how to help them to get access to financing, how to get them on the table with the right players, with the financing entities, the international agencies, even the infrastructure providers. But in mid-cities, the challenge is completely different. And that acknowledgement for us as a development bank, it's very important because that kind of put us in a different path, again, with all the partnership with the AFD. And then the final uh, segment of the cities are these small cities. There, the challenge is pretty difficult because we then have to be on the ground and understand what the challenges are and more importantly, to develop a tailor-made solution. As you might imagine, that requires a lot of resources and a lot of efforts from our side. Uh, to that end, we have developed different diagnostics instruments and uh, that has led us or helped us to A, learn from these cities, gather information, but more importantly, to understand what the key needs of these cities are. We believe that by doing this, we're helping all the different type of cities in Latin America in the challenge of coping with climate change. And, uh, you know, it's uh, this is evolving situation and we are learning as we're doing. And again, gathering information is, is central to this and being and partnering up with the local authorities, it's even more important because we learn from them. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Angel, for, for your remarks. Now uh, we will invite uh, Cristina Gamboa from, she's the Chief Executive Officer of the World Green Building Council, a global action network compromised of 70 green building councils around the world, catalyzing the uptake of sustainable buildings for everyone everywhere. Cristina is passionate about radical cross-cutting uh -huh cross-sector collaboration to bolster systematic systemic change and make this the decade of the net zero emissions she practices holistic to sustainability focusing on social economic benefits as well as environmental impacts christina Letts leads the world green building council coordination of the monumental cities and build environment day at cop 26 and Christina is an influential and inspirational leader in the field of sustainability. Thank you, Christina, for being part of the 
panel. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy you're here. This is like, no, you're perseverant. I think if you're here, you care, you care about the built environment, no? So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for that reflection. I know it is, it is a, the built environment is one of those ecosystems where there's many stakeholders. It is a complex value chain. And as we go forward, I think what, what I, I was, uh, what I, what I, what, what may, moves me is making things happen. There are barriers, but I think the time it is, has come where we're done over diagnosing and we just have to get the finance, get the projects, get the interventions and improve the quality of life and that the built environment enables climate action, enables resiliency, enables uh, inequalities and, and delivers, uh, you know, this vision of the sustainable development goals. So that slide that I'm sharing is about the World GBC's strategy. The World GBC is a network of 72 green building councils from around the world working in this sector, and they are conveners of different networks and businesses, We're mainly businesses, but we do work with governments and cities. And there's different layers of, of, of work being done. But the interesting thing is that this network has aligned over a vision of a holistic sustainability that goes into, this, into the vision of delivering better cities, right? And, and the network has like three main pillars. And I guess the, the summary is, the, the intention is that the built environment enables climate action. In different geographies, there, it may be more important to take mitigation a a actions most of the developing world doesn't not have to net anything. There's no, really no net zero action. But, of course, we don't want our cities in the developing world to become carbon intensive. So through a resiliency angle, right, we also address climate action and we also want mitigation. But being mindful that, uh, I mean, it, it would not be responsible not to, only, to, to not decarbonize and mitigate We've seen at this COP the big commitments moving into these ambitions of all, almost 90, 90 countries already having a net zero vision. That's the future. There's, that's how, where we have to go in and line. So the network uh, is aligned with the definition of the Marrakesh Partnerships for Climate Action. Uh, there's a human settlements pathway of climate action for cities. And there it is stated that cities have to be uh, reducing emissions at least by 50% by 2030 as, as other sectors. And, but of course, holistic sustainability means acting on resources and circularity. And here, the circular economy now is beyond the concept of just recycling. That's old school. It is about truly embracing uh, the, the best systems. If, if the developing world also is going to continue to urbanize at a high rate, it cannot be the same. It has, we think about the monumental demand on resources. Are we going to do the same? What's the impact on our ecosystemic services? What is the impact on biodiversity? Circularity is essential to keep the, the extraction we have already done more time into the system so we don't degrade more when we build. That, that is also changed. That's not the business model. It cannot be. Circularity also enables us to address upfront emissions and body carbon that happens in infrastructure. So the, the hierarchy of circularity and, and, and uh, working with Ellen MacArthur Foundation and, 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 and many key actors in this space brings clarity to the thinking and cities can embrace that vision. You saw today there was clean uh, construction uh, action and discussions. There is, there is, there is depth, depth to that topic. And finally, of course, health and well-being. We cannot have good cities if they're not healthy cities. You've seen the champion of this is WHO's Maria Neira all over COP getting you know, these big statements on the health sector being in the space. And we know it, that the cities either embrace our, our well-being, connect us also to nature, connect us to what, what's purpose, or cities just kind of kill us with pollution and, and everything and degradation. So, so the, the statement here is, there has to be a lot of things that have to be happening in this space for, for the change to happen at the built environment level. And there, the little images here, it's about collaboration, advocacy, education, innovation, 
and the investments, unlocking that every cent invested in infrastructure has to unlock the sustainable development goals. We cannot continue to, to do lineal systems and we cannot afford to waste uh, resources in, a, in, in, in the same old models. And if you go to the next slide, please. We uh, launched a, 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 in the blue zone recently two reports. I thank you. That avoids the next slide. Uh, two reports, but I want to flag this one in particular, Beyond Buildings. It is how an integrated approach to buildings and infrastructure is essential to climate action and sustainable development. You were saying the different scales of cities, how they embrace, embrace this change. The truth is that we will not get to improve infrastructure in cities if we don't change how we address the sectors that make up infrastructure. We cannot be, no longer be working in energy, transport, buildings over here, sanitation over here. They're all one part of a conversation. So the green building movement uh, that has improved the quality of buildings, right? Uh, the, the essential principles can get us also in that holistic systemic approach to delivering infrastructure in cities at different scales. Because it is about the SDGs give us the principles, the alignment, the vision, right? And then we can deploy those at different scales, making it about people, community, embracing culture and place. Of course, we don't know. We're not going to do things that are not appropriate to place culture and the needs. But the principles are there. And I, I guess my call is a call to action in this space. We did this analysis in that report. It's really interesting around, and, and you know it, this is not a, nothing new, but the built environment cuts across a lot of the SDGs, yes? And it is, if you'd like to, to look at a, a, the consumption of energy of the built environment, it's about responsible of 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. Buildings alone, almost 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. As we grow infrastructure, we cannot allow it to be energy over consuming energy, energy efficiency has to come in first. And that goes along, of course, with the innovation of the energy systems, uh, the transportation systems, but in particular, that we continue to, to, to stop bad investments. Why are we continuing to build bad infrastructure? Bad infrastructure basically is nothing, it's any, everything that is non-compliant with sustainable development goals. There's, the, the world is clear, the data is clear, and that's, that's, that's a way to embrace it. There's also a new report um, that we delivered that is, be, it's called Beyond the Business Case. Because when we talk this, it's all about how much more is it gonna cost me? That's another conversation that we have to stop. If we think the built environment on its whole life cycle, the decision today of investing in better, better infrastructure is not how it costs me more today, it's the investment to deliver quality to people throughout the use of the infrastructure. Throughout, how much is that infrastructure gonna be around in time? At least buildings are around 50, 80 years. Are, are we gonna think really it's cheaper to save now? Is it gonna be retrofitted in 10 years? What's the embodied carbon? How is it, if we can deploy renewables, can we get energy cheaper, for example, for people to have more money to invest in education? So putting people first in the decision making, changing the, the, the business case is about social value of infrastructure uh, from the built environment to people. And when in the business case you think about social value, and we explained it in that report, then the business case even become stronger for sustainable infrastructure. So that's another, another point I wanted to make. So the vision it's about, so if you, if you go through that, through that uh, process of that hierarchy of what the vision of the possible, it also, it also brings to you a, a different way. This is different, that's not the topic, I'll go back. It's, it gives you an understanding that cities, whatever happens first, involving people, but involving the good science we know from good urban planning, values, uh, the, as, and the sort of, of decision making that unlocks uh, the integration of systems, definitely will deliver climate action, transparency, and better quali quality of life in the, in, in, in the investments being done to deploy the systems change we need. 
And to make that happen, World GBC has been at, very active at COP26. We've been working for over a year in the campaign that we call Building to COP26. We invite you to follow it. With a coalition of NGOs like Minded, we uh, have some goals uh, this time around for the built environment that you see on the screen. Basically, we know that there's not enough regulations to unlock this vision of a sustainable built environment. Countries that are still going to be building infrastructure assets don't have the right policies to enable that quality infrastructure. Cities are key policy levers for procurement, better procurement, transparency, traceability, integration. And from, from the perspective of multilateral development banks, you can drive that conversation and bring that transparency and make them accountable for what's the impact and what is, what is the outcomes of the, the, the impact reporting, if you like, from a social perspective delivering on sustainability. And I think that's enough for me. <laughs> uh, there's some sessions happening on the 11th of November at the World GBC Twitter. You can find them. They're really interesting. This one is a conversation between mayors of cities, ministers, and private sector saying how the virtuous cycle of better decision making can improve cities because it is a conversation. What the national government does enables cities to act. What cities does and policy makers uh, say or enable, businesses can then unlock better demand signal. There's a demand signal, better investments, and then those investments deliver better outcomes for everyone. And in, and in particular, this is a good conversation as we go into a COP that is going to be in a developing country, shifting from the net zero conversation to the resiliency conversation. And in the climate action zone, there's going to be also another session happening. Though. So this one is at 9 a.m. And the next one from the Marrakesh Partnerships, you will see me there. Uh, hosting this session and it's about again the leadership from uh, the private sector and cities states and regions on how this vision can come forward so this is not abstract these are uh, actors take, uh, taking a step forward like you want to act so let's stop saying how much carbon how much degradation let's see how can we flip it because flipping the arguments like bringing social value is what is going to change the conversation instead of how much will it cost. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christina, from your remarks. I will uh, say that I'm staying with circularity. I think that that's really important. Health and the connection between cities and the environment. And without health, well, we have been seeing it right now. Uh, and um, people first. I think these are really important uh, items that we have to start really working on. So thank you very much. Uh, now we are continuing with uh, Professor Fernandez. He's He is Professor of Building Technology in the Department of Architecture and a practicing architect. Fernandez founded and directs right now the MIT Urban Metabolism Group, a high multidisciplinary research group focused on the resources, intensity of cities, and design the technology pathways for future urbanization. He is the chair of Su Sustainable Urban Systems for the International Society of Industrial Ecology and Associate Editor of the journal Sustainable City and Society. Thank you very much, Mr. Fernandez. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, um, the slides, please. Um, thank you for joining. I know it's the end of the day. So I'm going to make my message very, very crisp, very sharp. Um, it's, it's about a very specific issue, um, and that is the relationship between biodiversity and cities. Um, so the title, Global Resources and Ecosystems, Urbanization, Energy and Material Flows, and Biodiversity. So the link between biodiversity and climate change has been made. The IPBES report recently, uh, uh, slash IPCC report, there's no, there's no question that we're talking really about the same kinds of issues. They are intimately interlinked. 
but it's not useful for us to say that everything is linked to everything. It's actually much more useful to, to, to articulate what are the most important linkages. And one of the most important linkages between biodiversity and climate change are cities. So when you're in a landscape of extraction, most of that material is going to cities. It will be consumed in cities. So whether it's oil, coal, natural gas, the global economy, the global urban economy dominates. Uh, most fossil energy fuel carriers are consumed by cities directly or indirectly. So urban economies drive extraction, global extraction, and the trend is for more of that to happen. And as Cristina mentioned, a number of different uh, themes that I'm going to pick up on. The, um, one, uh, one of the things to remember is that the global population, urban population, is doubling in the next 30 years, or doubling or so, somewhere there. 90% of that's happening in the, in the developing world. So we have this enormous opportunity to leapfrog the carbon intensive uh, urban development and development of the built environment that we have become used to and we've become dependent on. But this is, a, this is also a, uh, a risk. It's, it's possible that we don't do that. And if we don't do that, the consequences to climate change are, are obvious where this entire conference is, is about that. But I actually want to articulate what the risks to biodiversity are. So many of the largest cities today in the developing world and the largest cities in the future are going to be adjacent to or um, drawing on biodiversity hotspots um, and important ecosystems. So part of this slide, I don't think the slide is there, but imagine in 2100, Lagos, Nigeria will have a population of close to 90 million people and, and cities in Latin America and Southeast Asia and Africa, especially Africa and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, are going to explode. And the consequences already we know to adjacent fragile ecosystems is, is very critical, but to regional ecosystems, to international ecosystems. So I actually want to be very clear, and this is where I, hopefully I'm being crisp. When we talk about biodiversity in cities, I think we're talking about three separate zones. The first zone is within the city itself. So you see number one there, urban land area. So a city is a violent extirpation of species in that area. You know, there's almost complete um, uh, elimination of the biodiversity. So that's one zone to think about. And I'll, I'll return to that in a second. The second zone, which is part of that city space, but is a very contentious space is the peri-urban space, the edge of cities, whether we're talking about mega cities or we're talking about small cities. It's that edge which is critical to the future of adjacent biodiversity and the carbon emissions for that city and, and, and elsewhere. And then number three is the non-urban area, everything that's not a city globally. And so these three domains require three different approaches. It's, kind of, it's, it's um, an, uh, analogous to your using three different sizes of cities to think about this issue. For, bi for biodiversity, it's very important that we think about these three zones separately. Of course, they're linked, but different strategies are going to be applied to each one. So for example, within the urban land area, within the city itself, clearly cities have been mostly disasters to local biodiversity. However, there are enormous opportunities to enrich existing biodiversity and to add to the biodiversity within an urban space to do things like rewilding that we were talking about before. And so there is an enormous potential for those agencies, municipal agencies that are in charge of tree canopy, uh, tree cover, the green spaces, green parks, to think along the lines of how do their actions and their budget maximize within the city space biodiversity. It's really, there's enormous potential there and very little work uh, globally in this area. In the second, in the peri-urban zone, there's a real interest uh, on the biodiversity side to make sure that the fragile ecosystems that are being threatened by land grabs, for that to be valued, and again, I completely 
resonate with Christina's point, we cannot think of the return on investment of that real estate uh, land grab. We have to think in, lo in longer term in longer term prospects and across many different dimensions like e ecosystem services value for that. And the perimeter there in many cities, especially in the developing world, is an absolutely critical space. And the, in the third zone, we're talking about now the relationship of urban urbanization globally to global extraction, getting back to those first images. So let me give you a, a few examples. So on the on the extent of urban land area, there are projections that tell us that there's going to be an enormous increase in the land area cities occupy. And again, much of that land area, which is an expansion of the perimeter, is attacking now very fragile ecosystems, really critical ecosystems that we really need to value in a different way. There's also very good information, very good research now that we know on the circular economy, on the global circular economy. Here's a reality, a reality check to all the discussion about the circular economy. The circular, we are right now today, we are about four to six percent circular globally. In other words, if you take everything that we extract from the lithosphere on an annual basis and you account for where it goes, only about four to six percent finds itself back into an extended service life in the economy. 94 to 96% finds its way towards a waste, future landfill, emissions, and everything else. That's a reality check to this discussion of, glo of, of circular economy. We have a long way to go. Maybe the most important place where we can attack is in cities. Because if cities do what Christine is saying, efficient buildings, low energy buildings, renewable grids, smart grids, uh, on-site uh, renewable energy production, all of these things, electrified transportation, electrified buildings, that the amount there, which is energetic use, which is the top yellow and green, that linear flow through will be reduced dramatically. And cities can do that because they're centralized, they can make decisions about infrastructure within their space relatively quickly compared to the national government. And so that's an enormous potential for us to address circularity globally through cities. And this is not particularly well known. I, I don't hear the cities discussion, the, the representatives of cities and city decision making in the larger global circular economy discussion as much as I think as we should. This is also an equity issue. So as we know, the resource transfer from the developing world to the developed world is undeniable. It's a, it's a one-way street, so resources are being consumed by the developing countries and developing economies, developed economies. Now, one thing that we, we should address is consumption-based carbon emissions accounting. So within a national border, you might be net zero based on your production, but like Sweden, you might be far from net zero because you have an oversized consumption of products that are coming from places where carbon emissions are just spewing into the atmosphere. And so, again, cities have an enormous potential here because cities are where wealth is created. It's also where innovation happens, and it's also where political will can be built faster for changing hum human behavior. And then the last slide is just the Environmental Solutions Initiative. This is all part of a, an initiative at MIT called the Environmental Solutions Initiative. We have a cities and climate change program. This work in biodiversity in cities is, is decidedly academic right now because there's a lot of emerging knowledge. But within very short amount of time, within the next year, two, three, there's going to be a, a, the call for action in many different ways in those three zones that I articulated. So I hope that was helpful to you, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fernandez. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, the main, the main issue right now is uh, the link, biodiversity and, and cities. And I think that how you explain it with the three zones, um, because we have always been thinking of the urban area and also between urban area and the rural zone, 
uh, I think it's uh, it's wonderful. For example, we, we worked with the University um, of New York uh, and study in Ecuador about um, um, cities in Puerto Viejo, but the cities in Ecuador are not only, the municipalities are not only the urban area, but they have like one city is considered with like three or four urban areas. And the interaction between these three or four urban areas between them and having this uh, non-urban or peri-urban, as you said, mentioned them, uh, it was really interesting and it was uh, disappointing because uh, we were talking about just these spots where there, there's no biodiversity right now, but if they, we didn't take into account this, it was going to be this huge, big, uh, uh, mega city and, and, well, having more, more problems. So thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to step down and change to the government and to the Green Climate Fund. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to invite now um, Kavita uh, Sinha uh, is the Deputy Director for Mitigation and Adaptation at the Green Climate Fund Division of Mitigation and Adaptation, where she leads the team of senior sector specialists in programming public sector investments. She has over 30 years of experience in green investment, market development strategy, and policy for sustainable infrastructure, clean tech, and energy sectors. Uh, she joined the GCF from the European Climate Foundation, where she was the program director for energy transition in Asia and the interim director for the Southeast Energy, Asia Energy Transition Partnership and multi-agency governments and philanthropy donors platform for scaling up the investments in energy transition in the region. Thank you very much, Kavita. Then, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm uh, pleased uh, welcoming uh, Isabella Roldano. Uh, she's the first elected, please, uh, woman elected to occupy the position of vice mayors in Recife after winning in 2020 the elections with Joao Campos. Uh, her mission is to serve the citizens, the citizens of Recife with the purpose of contributing to the promotion of equality and social transformation based on the education and sustainable development. Uh, as Vaser Majoris, she is also the strategic coordinator of projects, partnerships, and exchanges in the area of international relationships. Um, right now, she is the ambassador for South America of the Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance. Thank you very much. And I'm welcoming to Mr. Rodrigo Rodriguez. Uh, he is the specialist in climate change in sustainable development policies with significant experience in international environment negotiations and current is the Secretary of Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation at the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development of Argentina. He holds a bachelor in degree in political sciences with a specialization in international relations. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodrigo. So now we are starting the panel with governments and with um, the Green Climate Fund, because the idea, I, I know, um, uh, the idea is to have a small conversation, and I understand that Mr. Rodriguez has to leave, so uh, the first question will be for, for him. Um, and just to know what is the policy and how are you working in climate change and cities, which is the, what is the perspective from the government of Argentina? That's like the first, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, apologize in advance, I'm uh, leading the negotiations from my country, so I, I have a meeting. Uh, we are all here because we are struggling to have decisions on this COP. So we have a long night and long three days uh, to come. Um, just uh, quick comments. Um, first of all, I couldn't agree more with Professor Fernandez's approach 
Uh, we have four uh, intergovernmental scientific uh, panels at the UN related to uh, environment. IPCC, climate change, that sent us this wake-up call in August saying that we have a very little window and we are in deep trouble if we are not to succeed in promoting climate action. Secondly, the uh, biodiversity uh, panel that shows that, that the fifth extinction in the world, in this planet, has started. The, three, the third is about pollution. We uh, reach all the, the, the thresholds related to pollution. And the fourth, and the less known, but one of the most important is the International Resource Panel that shows us that we are to face in the very short terms, in terms of one to two decades, shortage in uh, the provision of strategic natural resources for sustaining the development as we know it. Uh, these four agendas are really complex, really dangerous, and they synergize. And this, they will synergize in a very short time. So that will require a new approach for uh, development uh, planning and also for urban planning. Since the only certainty we have is uncertainty. No one knows what comes next. We are, uh, we, our tradition is not to plan our cities for a dynamic change uh, at the velocity and, and the, the pace and the scale we need to face. Our coastal cities are being hit by storms. Uh, we have water where, where we were where we, uh, where, uh, where having a draft and the way around. And we need to rethink the way we uh, plan our cities and our life. And we understand that the, appro the approach that Carolina asked me is about innovation. We need to innovate. We need to think again and again and again. And uh, it's also a learning by doing approach because uh, humankind has never the opportunity to do this, uh, uh, to face this kind of challenge at this, uh, at this time. Concretely, I would like to, uh, in terms of Argentina, uh, we have 92% of our population living in urban areas in less than 1% of our territory. So we know about uh, these urban, urban issues. And definitely, uh, as Professor Fernandez mentioned, now we have the best consciousness about the need to take care to, to restore and to preserve the uh, ecosystems that are around our cities for the health of the cities. Um, this is something that we really need to pay attention. Uh, and this is also an opportunity because we understand that we are still on time for making this uh, paradigm shift in the way we think our cities and our lives. Um, concretely, I would like to share with you one concrete uh, action because sometimes we speak and it's about like main ideas and, and guidelines and, and principles and that. However, it's important to show that uh, it's possible to make concrete on the ground uh, changes. We've been working with CAF uh, with, for um, a coastal adaptation a project, binational project with Argentina and um, Uruguay uh, with funds from the, the adaptation fund. And I would like to stress something on this and highlight something uh, that I would say that is a condition for promoting sustainable development. First of all, long-term planning, long-term vision, building uh, political will, ensure participation and the legitimacy of the policy in order to make it sustainable. And why do I mention this? This project started in the previous administration of Uruguay and Argentina. 
right side government from Argentina, left side uh, government from Uruguay. Both government shift. Uh, and then we like, shift also the colors of the country. However, this project continued. And because it was well agreed, there was consensus about the need of promoting resilience and adaptations in our cities. And there was, need, there was a consensus on the need to learn on how to prepare our cities for facing the challenges that climate change will uh, present to our, our, our cities uh, in the whole uh, region of the Mesopotamic. Uh, I would like to stress that because it sounds like very simple, but it's not. In our countries, in our region, uh, consensus building is a whole issue. And maybe it's one of the biggest issues for promoting sustainable development on, and protecting our people for the adverse effects to climate change. So I would like to mention this as a, I wouldn't like to say like a, a success, but a lesson learned. Uh, that, and, and take note of that because we, we understand that is, that is very uh, useful in order to promote long-term policies that can help us to learn on how to be prepared for what comes next. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me here. I'm so sorry, so sorry for my, my fellow uh, panelists to, to have to leave because like, this, is, this is negotiations. Thank you so much and thank you for having me here. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, no, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. I don't know, please, Cavita, if you want to sit over here, okay? Um, well, uh, as, as, as Rodrigo said, uh, in CAP we are having this uh, project um, between Argentina and Uruguay. Uh, it's in all of the border of the Rio Uruguay, where the inundations get more or less a 17, 14 meters, uh, the river, uh, so really the cities are, are, are having these uh, problems. In Argentina, we are working with Concordia, with Colón, that are cities that are also touristic ones. Um, and what he mentioned between both governments, I think it's important to, to remark that uh, it, it is a binational proposal and a binational project where this consensus uh, has been along like five years right now, so I think that's important to, to mention uh, also in, in, in developing climate action now. Uh, and then, well, uh, taking into account, Cavita, that you are here, um, I would like to, to mention uh, what is a uh, city's uh, perspective for the GCF um, right now, what are your uh, experiences or what are your expectations for cities also well, in Latin America or the Caribbean? Thank you. Thank you for that question. First of all, thank you so very much to CAF for inviting me to join this uh, discussion on urban cities. Um, the case has already been made how important the cities are. Uh, there already there's about 56% of the population living here and by 2050 it might be two-thirds of the population living in cities. Especially for Africa, much of the infrastructure in the cities uh, will be built in this decade and later. All of that, all the development that has happened so far, we will see a rapid change in that. Much more than that will happen. So there is a huge, humongous opportunity, as you said, uh, Professor Fernandez, that to uh, create a transformative shift in the way we think and design. So for those who don't know about GCF, uh, Green Climate Fund is a uh, the financing mechanism of the UNFCCC. Uh, at present, we have committed about $10 billion uh, to uh, various different uh, activities for low emissions uh, and uh, climate resilient development in developing countries. Our mandate is pretty unique. Our mandate is to catalyze a paradigm shift. So we are a catalytic fund. You're not like a very typical development fund. And we are a catalytic fund with a very specific aim for a transformative shift or a paradigm shift to low emission climate resilient development. In that context, from the urban point of view, um, our outcome, urban outcomes that we are looking at come across for two sides, uh, four outcomes. Uh, two are mitigation-oriented and two are adaptation-oriented. 
Uh, the two uh, mitigation oriented are low emission building, uh, cities, uh, transport, and uh, appliances, which takes into account, as Professor Fernandez mentioned, much of these uh, cities are cons urban concentration of materials uh, and energy demand, which comes from all these various end use. So we're looking at low emission, uh, building, low emission cities. So that's one aspect of the outcome area that we are investing in. Second area is the low emission transport. Uh, how the city is built and designed, the urban form of the city practically affects uh, the energy consumption in uh, the city, the embedded energy in the buildings and the construction that happens there, as well as the end use by the residents of the city. We're also looking at ensuring that the urban compact, urban design is compact and the form is such that uh, reduces the need for travel uh, as much as possible. Uh, fully conscious that in many of the developing countries, uh, transportation is yet not well developed enough for connectivity, for access to livelihoods, uh, you know, uh, and jobs and schooling, etc. So this is not about eliminating or, or uh, reducing, but making sure that it is rightly designed, urban compact, designed to ensure people are able to access what they need to access. So these are two mitigation-oriented outcomes we work towards. Uh, we're also working towards two adaptation-oriented uh, outcomes in cities. One is uh, resilient infrastructure. Much of the large cities, as we know, are in coastal zones, uh, very, very threatened, uh, as well as the developments that are happening depending on how the urban forms are designed, the long-term planning of uh, investments in urban cities uh, and um, municipal forms will uh, create either more resilient societies uh, or it will increase the fragility. So that, that's another area that we want to work on and to ensure that the new urban forms and existing urban forms transition into more resilient structures. What we mean here is not just creating new assets and sort of uh, building on a resilient layer on top of it, but a very systemic assessment of where the uh, fault lines are, of what the uh, uh, climate uh, risks are, and how ecosystem-based approaches or nature-based approaches could substitute for or work together with gray infrastructure. And that's something that we are paying a lot of attention to. To cite an example, uh, the cooling facility, uh, which includes some of the countries in the Latin America, which was approved in October just a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, there, the, uh, even though the uh, outcome is to ensure cooling in um, s buildings, as well as uh, you know, uh, residential areas as well as in health facilities. The solutions that are being proposed are first ecosystem-based approaches. How can they be designed in a manner? Where should they be designed so that the um, urban air flows and the system that we work with nature to ensure that provides the first cooling? The second element is to look at uh, the building um, materials itself and uh, the passive architecture in, uh, integrating green um, within the buildings uh, as well as white roofs. Uh, so after all of the nature-based and ecosystem-based approaches and passive approaches are taken care of, whatever residual demand there then there is, is then how then we make that uh, to be the least emit emitting sources. So that's how we are trying to integrate uh, our uh, projects to which we are pri giving priority. Another example I will quote is uh, in Jamaica, through our readiness grant program, uh, the government of Jamaica is working uh, with the Oxford University in the UK and with the support from the UK government to look at systemic risks from climate to all the buildings uh, and cities and they're looking at integrating um, the urban e ecosystem-based approaches. The idea is to create, actually validate the uh, value that uh, nature brings to the city and urban forms, and use that valuation methodology then to be able to develop a pipeline of projects which can be then either proposed to GCF or others. So we are supporting uh, cities and governments uh, from the design and uh, readiness preparation all the way to project uh, facilities itself. Uh, another example I can give is the Subnational Capital Fund, uh, where uh, GCF is investing in equity. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the need for innovation, where uh, smaller projects don't act, uh, get uh, a lot of capital, and this is uh, uh, the recognition that a lot of development will happen at the subnational level and not at the national level, city, municipal level. 
And this uh, equity fund where we put, provided the first loss equity of $150 million. The total value is about uh, $750 million. The idea is to catalyze equity investments in small to medium size uh, projects, 5 million to 75 million projects, which are focused on urban innovation to be able to build more resilient and uh, low emission uh, solutions within the city itself. So we are looking at various different ways to catalyze change in cities and transform the way urban form uh, works and acts with people. At the end of the day, it is people-centric. The final solution that we work on in cities outcome is the food, health, and uh, water security. And uh, we are hoping that we will have better pipelines or projects which integrate these various different outcomes into uh, projects that come to us. With that, I'll stop for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kavita. Um, I think um, I, I didn't know about the cooling facility. Uh, I think it, it, it is very interesting, and I would like to, to, to search about it. Uh, the last word you said is that for food security, health, and I don't know if I missed another one? Water. Okay, great. That's to take it into account because CAF is also now in the process of um, starting the structuring of a proposal in cities for the GCF. So uh, thanks for those inputs. Uh, now, um, from the local governments, uh, how are you working and how you're integrating climate change and how is the interaction between local governments and national governments to do this uh, process? Um, it's okay. Okay, thank you, Carol. Uh, first of all, thank very much for staying here at this time. In, uh, in this place here with CAF for the invitation. Thank you. And about the question, Carol, uh, I'm just say uh, as the 16 Recife as the 60th most vulnerable city to climate change in the world. So it's very serious for us. Uh, and has made a Recife has made a confront in the climate crisis as a priority through concrete actions is trained in the least, last eight years. So in the current administration of Mayor João Campos, action has have been in, intensified to to ensure compliance with the Sustainable Development Goals and Recife's leading role in this agenda that is so essential for us present and our future. The Local Climate Action Plan is a strategic document designed in a col collaboration with ECLEI, municipal board bodies and civil society which demonstrate how the city is strategically planning to reduce greenhouse gas emission and adapt to the consequence of climate change. It provides an alignment between planned action, legislation, and commitment made by the municipality. Based on the definition of goals, Recife aims to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 at the latest following a holistic and integrated approach that will bring a series of benefits towards sustainable development, such as the creation of socioeconomic opportunities, reduction of poverty and inequality, and improving people's health and protecting nature. Unfortunately, the interaction between the national and, lo and the local government has been hampered due to the absence of national public policy for the environment and the anachronistic model of economic development is still based on deforestation and a pollution energy matrix. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Isabella, for your words. Then again, Kavita. Um, what are your expectations to, uh, from the GCF to, to have more proposals of cities, to have a regional proposal for Latin America, for the Caribbean, or um, local for uh, all um, for different countries? I don't know what what is the what expectations do you have from from Latin America to present proposals 
in cities? Um, thanks for that question. Um, uh, Latin American Caribbean region is pretty much urbanized, so we are expecting uh, the pro proposals that come to us um, will follow three or four of the uh, paradigm shifting pathways that uh, our sector guideline that was published, I think very recently, it's up on our uh, website. Uh, the four pathways that we are looking at uh, sort of um, aligns with what I was talking about earlier in terms of our outcomes. The first, first pathway is uh, ensuring decentralized uh, renewable energy systems, so conversion of the energy systems within cities into renewable energy, so low emission energy use within cities. Uh, the second element is about the building itself, so making sure that the buildings are low emission buildings. The third pathway is uh, nature-based solutions for cities, and the fourth pathway is about um, was the fourth pathway. It's on the website. <laughs> so I'm too tired now. Um, so, so the whole idea is to be able to look at these four pathways to catalyze a change in cities. Uh, we are looking at um, what we call it as a platform-based approaches that can scale and not uh, single solution uh, projects uh, on uh, creating the uh, urban infrastructure. So what, what do I mean by that? Uh, we are looking for uh, GCF. As you know, GCF is a catalytic financing facility for uh, transformational change. So where could we come in first that can then allow others to follow? So we could be the anchor investors. We could be uh, equity investors. We can uh, bring in grant reimbursable grant components or non-reimbursable grant components in a manner that makes uh, the investment viable, that creates a clear climate impact additionality where other investors uh, would otherwise not come. We definitely, uh, what we are looking at also is to ensure that we don't displace uh, any capital that would have naturally flown or come to the uh, project, either whether it is uh, public capital or private capital. So we're looking at ensuring that our concessionality is just rightly balanced to catalyze the change that we are looking for and to create uh, that in a transformational way so that once the GCF funding ends, uh, the uh, environment in which that project is uh, is uh, tr transformed for all. So that's what we are looking at. Uh, we have projects in our pipeline uh, from uh, circularity on uh, you know water systems, wastewater system circularity. We have projects on uh, solid waste circularity uh, within the systems. We are looking at projects on uh, low emission transport. We're also looking at projects on uh, climate proofing uh, buildings and solutions in a more holistic manner with uh, integrated nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Then I, I would like to know if I understood very well, but these four pathways, uh, you are mentioning that it's more like in a cross-cutting proposal or still um, in a sectoral way. It's water, transport, energy, or it's much in this? Yeah. No, uh, we definitely we don't see... Uh, GCF ever investing in just a single sector project anymore. Uh, many of these single sector projects are uh, oftentimes, especially in the Latin America where uh, middle income, upper middle income countries, uh, these are already uh, financially viable projects. Mm -hmm. So what we are looking at is those solutions which are systemic solutions or holistic solutions uh, that can ensure low emission and, and climate resilient development. So we are looking okay. at those aspects together. Great, thank you very much. And then taking into account what she just mentioned, for the local governments, normally the, we are divided in, uh, uh, in by sectors. We have the Secretariat of Transport or Mobility, the water, the environment, and that's the same division that we have maybe in national governments, the ministries, we have the, this division. So I think maybe, uh, do you think this is a challenge for municipalities to be able to present an integrated, holistic, cross-cutting proposal a, and a, a project to the to the GCF, taking into account what you how you are uh, developed in, in in the municipality, how how, how you are divided. Yeah, uh, it, it's been a big challenge. Yes, it's true. But uh, as if it's already a reference, an environmental preservation. So with 38% of its territory protected by 25 natural conservation units, which are added to green area protection property and urban afforestation. 
In the first month of this year, alone more than 150 trees were planted, spread across 30, 30 neighborhoods. Wow. <laughs> during, <laughs> during a week, during Environment Week, at the beginning of June, we launched the Eco Recife program, which aims to eliminate the consumption of disposable plastic material in the municipality public service, in addition to establishing action for energy efficiency and reduction of water consumption based on a policy low carbon in the example of public authorities. Uh, the program also established that the initiative must be extended to other municipal public services units, as well as other entities in the public sphere and private initiative. So yes, it's a big challenge for us. In order to promote good, clim good climate governance and a transversal execution of the municipal sustainability policy, we have implemented a sustainability and change committee the name is CONCLIMA, which counts on the participation of civil society and the executive group of sustainability and climate change. The name is JCLIMA, composed of technicians from the Recife City Hall, from different secretariats who contribute with data and qualitative information to care out of the greenhouse gas uh, emission and reduction plan and its monitoring. Uh, we are formulating a proposal to create a municipal commission for sustainability development and a municipal program to, for the implementation of the 2030 agenda in our city. It's time, really. It's time to act now. So uh, I really, I really appreciate to stay with you. Um, I'm sorry, Carol, but I need to go because yeah. we have another agenda now okay, at CFPN. No, we're just so, finishing right now. Yes, and I, I so really to say thank you so much. I try to do my best here, no. but because our people need need to action really. Recife is the most vulnerable capital in Brazil. So for us, it's very urgent to to do something. And uh, our goal is to do together, not alone. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you very much, uh, Vice um, Isabella, sorry, Isabella de Roldano. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation. I think it was great. I, it was interesting also to have Brazil from the local perspective, to have the national perspective for Argentina. And thank you very much also, Cavita, for participating here from having the GCF. Uh, we we'll still have a lot of work to do between governments and GCF, and well, CAF is just uh, mobilizing a lot of resources. So thank you very much again for your participation. Bye-bye.